All right, it's 5 p.m. Similar to um, our previous meetings, uh, the meeting is now being recorded. It is also being live streamed and will be available on YouTube uh, following the meeting. Uh, just a couple of reminders. Right now, everybody um, has the ability to mute and unmute themselves, um, but please still continue to use the raise hand feature um, to help with crosstalk and for um, facilitation. You can access the raise hand function by clicking on the participants button in the bottom middle and then going to raise hand on the right hand side. I will not be checking the chat super quickly. So if you would like to make a comment, um, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, and with that, and it looks like everybody is using their actual name. So we're good there. So thank you everybody for changing your names. Um, and we'll begin this meeting as we've done the others um, with roll call. So welcome to meeting number four, the Public Safety Advisory Board. And starting with uh, Commander McDonald, are you present? I am here. Excellent. Uh, Officer Nunn? I am here. Shelby Rahala. Yep, I'm here. Uh, Michael O'Brien. Uh, okay. Oh, I, I see you there. Okay, so you are. I'm here. here. Sorry, I didn't oh. unmute. No worries. Uh, Abdi Rahim Muhammad. I'm here. And Emilio Calderon. Here. Liz Newton. I'm here. And John Trin. Present. Jimmy Brown. I am here. Lee Landers. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> Patty Lofgren. I'm here. Justin Lowe. I'm here. Danny Rauda. I'm here. Valerie Sasaki. Uh, all right, I don't see Valerie. Uh, Shahrazad Whalen will not be joining us. Um, John Gearhard is on a leave of absence, and uh, Jeff Mott. Here. Excellent. So that is roll, and we do still have a quorum. Um, moving into public comments. So we started last week with our first public comment period where we invite the public to come and either submit uh, written comments to the board or come and speak to us in person. Um, this is really important, I think, for all of us to be able to hear what the public is thinking and to make sure that we have yet another outlet for connecting with people and making sure that we're doing the work of the community. Uh, we did have three written comments uh, that came in. I believe that they were sent out earlier today, so I hope you had a chance to read them. We are also uh, lucky enough tonight to have a member of the public who has come to speak with us in person. Um, Ms. Chase, welcome. You will have three minutes to make your comment um, and feel free to begin. There we go. You think as a teacher, I'd know how to unmute, but we don't use you. Um, yeah, I hopefully you read uh, the email about Fern Street and, and I'm not 100% sure this is the forum to bring this up, but we're, uh, those of us who live on Fern Street, I've been there 26 years, are uh, super concerned about the traffic problem on safe, on Fern along with the pedestrians. Um, am I able to share my screen? Can I do that real quick? I just wanted to show you, in case you didn't see it, um, this picture of Fern Street is on a side of Bull Mountain. So we've got some pretty steep driveways going up and some pretty, pretty steep steep driveways going down and there's blind curves as you can see here. There's a blind hill, there's hardly any shoulder. Um, so pedestrians have to walk on the pavement which is only about four feet, 14 feet wide in some spots. So as you can see like from the picture, car actually has to go into the opposing lane on the bright blind curve to go around the pedestrians. Um, they did a traffic study uh, 2019 that said there's only only 940 car trips per day 
Um, I think it's way more than that now. Um, the speed limit speed is about 24 miles per hour, which is, as you can see, probably unsafe. We have 15 mile an hour speed bumps. And the biggest problem is it used to be a, a dead end and they made it a through street. And um, there's also, uh, so people are using as a traffic cut through. Um, it's, you know, maybe saving one to two minutes. They don't have to go down Walnut and around. Uh, barrows they can cut through on Fern Street but there's about a car every 15 to 30 seconds and there's also the Ascension Trail right off this road uh, so there's a ton of pedestrians and we're just really concerned about someone getting hit um, and killed uh, and I can only find one solution since this is a neighborhood street it's supposed to be for cut throughs we'd have to redesignate it as a local only street and maybe tepor temporarily dead end it um, until such time as it could be a uh, make sidewalks or a walking trail or some kind of thing to make it a little safer. Um, I know as a neighborhood, a neighborhood street, they can't block it off, but it'd have to be redesignated as a local only street. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up that I, I'm really concerned and all the neighbors on the street are also concerned that someone's bound to get uh, hurt on this. So I don't know if anything you guys can do about that or you know, if that's something, I did bring it up with the Tiger Transportation Advisory Board, and they did discuss it for about 45 minutes, but they didn't really have a good solution because of its designation. They can't divert or put more traffic controls on it as long as it's still a neighborhood street, so. Yeah, um, Ms. Chase, thank you very much for bringing this up um, and coming and delivering your public comment. I did just want to let you know that the mission of this board is to, um, really do conduct a thorough comprehensive review of the practices and procedures of the uh, city police department, municipal court and social justice initiatives. Um, we're not working on transportation um, related issues, at least not in this board, um, but I know that there are city staff members who can direct you to city council um, and maybe bring it back up with the transportation review board. But thank you very much for taking the time this evening. I I didn't know where to go, so I started with you guys, but I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on to our next order of business. Uh, we are working on the work plan this evening. So just to recap, um, let me share my screen. So we are on um, meeting number four. And we're going to work on the work plan. Uh, we'll be doing Tiger Policing 101 this evening, as well as the election of vice uh, chair and vice chair um, at the end of the evening. And what we've done so far with the work plan is we did come together on our first meeting and we worked through the mission of the board. Um, you can read that here. We also had a discussion on the vision of the board where we added um, several classes um, that we wanted to particularly spend um, attention and center the conversation around. And we changed one of the, the values, um, again, centering the conversation um, that we have um, these e during these evenings around those that are most impactful. Uh, last week, we completed the topic schedule. We worked through all of the different units and added topics that we'll be discussing as a group. And we also started work on the draft work plan. We've been working on that for um, two meetings. And tonight, we are going to complete um, the draft work plan. Um, starting with looking at the recommendation process. So um, this is the wording that is currently in that work plan, um, that our goal is to provide an opportunity for the board to learn and share, um, as well as provide that feedback to city council and to make recommendations. And we'll do this through a three-step process, um, discussing a meeting topic, the group formulation of the recommendation, and then having each board member have the opportunity to share their views um, to capture that in the statement. Um, we will not necessarily always need to vote, but if we do need to vote, um, there will, we'll strive for consensus of 12 or uh, 12 out of 15 votes. Um, does anyone have any questions, discussion around this recommendation process?
seeing no hands, I'm going to move on to the next slide um, and we'll be going, uh, Jimmy, yes. Um, <clears throat> I may have missed this somewhere, um, but within the recommendation process, this, this focuses primarily on the internal recommendations to city council. Um, how do we, or do we present recommendations to the public that we have been made or does that go through the city council process? It is an excellent question um, that we will answer right here on the next slide. Uh, oh, my bad. No, you're, you're just, <laughs> you are on top of it. Um, so the council, or the board as it's currently written will make quarterly reports to the city council including updates on the progress of the work plan and proposing any recommendations. Um, when that is um, within the decision-making authority of the chief or the city manager, um, they may implement it without cancel action. Um, if they decline to implement it, it will be forwarded to council for review and consideration. And then if that recommendation requires additional action, such as approval by a budget committee or bargaining with the unit, the recommendation will not be effective until all um, approvals are received. Does that answer your question, Jimmy? Um, so that gets us to city council. Uh, what about the broader community for, for those folks who may be interested in, you know, what kinds of information has the PSAB recommended or uh, what has happened with those recommendations? Yeah, and so all of the recommendations that come out of the PSAB will be made to city council, which is all public record, um, as well as being shared on the PSAB website. Uh, Jeff Mott, I see your hand. Yeah, uh, thank you. If we go down the path of recommendation requires additional action, um, waiting for approvals, it, can we add something about providing quarterly updates back to the PSAB if, if that is still in process, whatever it may be? Um, I'm not sure about Sorry. quarterly updates, but yeah, definitely like making sure that that loop is continued to close. Um, definitely um, it makes sense. Um, Justin? Justin also has a question. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead of the schedule on this, but I was curious if this process takes on a different form if we are working on a topic that involves uh, state action or federal advocacy, as I know some of them do in our topic schedule. Yeah, um, an excellent point. Um, and any areas that would require city or would require state, act, state advocacy or federal advocacy, the recommendation from the PSAB would be that the city advocate for that. It wouldn't be that the city makes some sort of change. Um, so then it would follow this similar process where if the chief or city manager can advocate for that directly, then they could. If they decline to, then it would go to city council. I see. Thank you. Um, is it all right if I ask a follow-up uh, on that information? Please. Uh, so given that process, will the Public Safety Advisory Board be able to still participate uh, in that advocacy uh, and that additional work alongside the council? Um, that is an excellent question. Um, actually, Liz has her hand up right now, who can probably answer that as well. Yeah, I just, uh, an answer to that, and then I wanted to make sure I understood where um, Jimmy Brown was coming from. I would envision recommendations coming from the Public Safety Advisory Board being um, as when information uh, is going to be considered by the council, we would get that re those recommendations out to the public. And my view would be we would be giving the public also an opportunity to weigh in, if you will, um, so that they can, you know, they can take a look and we'll have some sort of process, I would imagine, where they would be able to voice questions, you know, they need more information, whatever. And I would say if the pub, when we as the Public Safety Advisory Board make recommendations to council um, about federal advocacy or anything that is outside the council's control, we would want to make sure that we're also articulating our role in that advocacy. So we would be coming, uh, my hope is that we coming, 
a kind of a funny word, but we're going to be coming with fully baked recommendations. So this is an area we need think we need to see change. We understand it goes to the state. Maybe we've educated ourselves about the testimonies required. You know, here's an approach we could take. So I, you know, my hope is that you know we weigh in on that. And I want to make sure I understood the question that Jimmy Brown had. I would envision a public loop too as we're moving forward to the council that the public's made aware and you know we're moving along with them to educate them about the recommendations give them a chance to weigh in ahead of time at the meeting however we see that it's going to depend if it's more complicated it might be a little more robust if it's pretty clear and kind of uh, you know on off switch kind of thing it might not need to be as robust but I, I think, you know, I value the community also being involved as we move these recommendations forward. So I was hoping I was providing some clarification to Jimmy's question, but if not, let me know. <laughs> Jimmy, I see your hand. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Liz, uh, because that's that's really what I was trying to, to get to was uh, the, the importance of having a connection or a feedback loop to the general public. We all represent um, different elements of, of the community, whether it's the student community or the elders or houseless or uh, communities of color. We, we all, I believe, represent or have or are standing in that kind of, of place. And so while we are making you know, recommendations to council based on information that we've heard, um, the, I, I think it's important to be able to, to loop back to the community before it gets to city council uh, and gets put up on city council website. My, my concern simply is that not everyone may be looped into uh, the city council website. And so they may not you know, no, you can go to city council and you can see on the website what the PSAB has, has put forward. And, and then uh, similar to our public comment period, uh, come in and, and, and make, uh, or, or if we're all still Zooming, uh, uh, get online and, and, and make your, your comments known to, to council. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to elongate the process necessarily, but I, I think this, this is giving us an opportunity to, to be able to bring more voices to the table as we go forward. And, and I agree. Um, and that's why I think it's important to have those robust connections before they go to council. Um, so people have an understanding of, of what's being recommended by us. And so, yeah, I agree. I'm hoping we can have some robust connections. And if we don't have to have Zoom, we can get out in the community and talk to folks. So, yeah, I think that's going to be important before we um, finalize the recommendations for council. So thanks for asking. Uh, Patty. So I have a question just in general, um, where, aside from the City of Tigard website, where are people finding out about, I know that there's a PSAB section there, but aside from that, how are they finding out that they're open for these public comments, et cetera, et cetera? Is there another avenue where people are getting this information? Um, Eduardo, please jump in, but I do believe that there has been social media posts um, quite frequently for, for the PSAB um, meetings, inviting people um, for public comment. Eduardo, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, I've worked with our communications manager to make sure that uh, things are posted on social media. Uh, but as far as non-digital uh, formats, no, we don't, we don't post them around uh, the community. Uh, in a print version, uh, but people do have the option to submit um, handwritten comments, uh, and we've provided an address uh, for those folks uh, who, who would prefer to communicate with us that way. Uh, and if uh, someone did submit handwritten comment, then I would transcribe that for the, uh, for the board. Thank you. Senator Um any other questions or comments about this, uh, about the city council recommendation process? 
Um, wonderful. Well, we are, that is the um, end of the work plan. So all of this is going to be, all of the changes that have been made um, that we have been collecting over the last couple of meetings is going to be repackaged into that seven page document that you received before the first meeting into an updated work plan um, with the changes. And that will all be presented to city council, the topic schedule and the work plan um, at the March 9th meeting. And we'll discuss this a little uh, again near the end of the meeting, um, but this will be one of the first duties of the incoming chair and vice chair is taking the work the Public Safety Advisory Board has already done um, and bringing it to city council. So next on our agenda, agenda is Tiger Policing 101. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Commander McDonald. Bear with me a second here while I share my screen. Oh, no problem. Um, and as the commander is going through um, his presentation, still feel free to raise your hands as you're going along. Um, I'll be looking for the hands and we'll be able to interrupt um, and ask questions to make sure that it's interactive and everybody's able to get what they need out of the presentation. No, hi, Tia, how are you? No. Okay, can everybody see, can everybody see my screen? Yes, you were sharing. Okay, perfect. And you can hear me too, because I lost some of those uh, features when I shared my screen. Well, I've met all of you um, uh, virtually a few times and I, hang on, I'm sorry. You're gonna find out very quickly that I'm not as solid on technology as I would hope to be. <laughs> so here we go. Um, so I am Jamie McDonald and I, uh, I am a commander here at the police department and currently I oversee our, uh, our services division, which is our detectives, property and evidence, uh, records, our professional standards, our SROs, but I've also had the opportunity to oversee our patrol division, which is all pretty much all the men and women in the department that are in uniform, which is what most all of you see. And um, we're gonna take an adventure. Uh, it's, you know, through the, uh, the journey of a tigered police officer, but we wanted to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to kind of learn a little bit about the organization, about how we're structured and how things look as a uh, police department as your police department. And before, before I get started, I, I, this first slide is really, um, it, it really shows a lot of pieces of the department uh, right here. So the, the one on the left uh, where Officer Mace is with a couple of uh, young community members there, she's uh, in a partnership with Washington Square Mall, Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue. Um, and some other community partners, uh, the Red Cross, they're teaching uh, people how to do hands-only CPR. She's one of our CPR instructors. She's been with us for mm, a little, probably, well, over 10 years for sure. And she came to us from uh, DHS. She was a caseworker with Department of Human Services before she became a police officer. So she, um, and she worked child welfare cases uh, with them. So uh, there she is, uh, you know, working in one of our community events. The one on the top right is one of our property and evidence specialists. Uh, she's been with the organization for over 25 years, um, Kristen and, uh, so she is uh, one of our two property and evidence specialists and she is there to catalog, um, catalog our evidence and make sure that it, that it stays uh, ready to go out to the DA's office or be released back to an owner when it comes time. And then the one on the bottom right, um, that one actually tells quite a story. Uh, that's Officer Gregston. Um, that's not his child, that is a child in the community that he was comforting after a, a pretty critical incident. Uh, in fact, he just returned. Uh, he's a captain in the uh, military. He just returned from a deployment here about two weeks ago. We're really excited to have him back. So there's a few members of our of our organization um, as you uh, as you get an opportunity to get to know them. 
um, and and we'll have some more photos. I'll, you know, we'll go as we go through this. You'll get to learn a little bit more. So here's a little bit about myself. I started with the uh, police department in 2001. I spent eight years in private business um, trying to figure out what it was I wanted to do before I realized that that uh, being a police officer would be something that could provide me an opportunity for some level of fulfillment. And, uh, you know, that idea of helping people is something that you'll hear police officers say time and time again, to be here to help people, to try and make a difference in someone's life. And uh, that's really why we, uh, we do all this. I didn't choose that photo, by the way. Um, our education assist, educational assistant that's helping us with our uh, with some of our PowerPoint presentations, because, you know, I probably wouldn't be able to figure out how to put it into a PowerPoint. Uh, she chose that one. So um, but my wife loves that photo, actually. Uh, so a little bit about my journey. I've uh, I I've been an instructor, uh, uh, a firearms instructor, a, a uh, a force on force instructor, which will mean a lot more when we talk about our training later in in later sessions, uh, field training officer, a school resource officer. I was promoted to sergeant in 2010 and then to lieutenant in 2014. I've been in my current uh, position at this uh, as a commander since July of 2016. And then we talked about uh, where I uh, uh, the different responsibility I've ever had in this in this uh, role. Any questions at this point? All right, we're gonna roll forward. Yep, so no we're gonna talk a little bit about the structure of the organization. There's uh, Chief McAlpine there, looking dapper in her class A uniform. Um, and so we have three different divisions in the police department. So administration, which the chief is, the, uh, is over the administration division as well the operations division, which is patrol. Um, so like I said, all the men and women in uniform, our traffic teams, uh, some of our uh, outsourced uh, teams that we do with uh, countywide are, are under operations as well, such as the, the tactical negotiations team or the SWAT team. We don't have our own here at Tigard. It's one that we share responsibilities countywide. So uh, the county, uh, the sheriff's office actually is basically in charge of it. They're the administrators of it. And then we provide staff to assist with that team. And they participate on that as a interagency team. And then the services division is the one that I currently oversee. Now I'm going to show you our, um, this is our org chart, our organizational chart. So it probably looks kind of crazy, but what it does is it, gives you a little bit of an idea, and I, it's probably really small, especially for Lee if he's on his phone. Um, but uh, this, uh, this gives a, tells a story of, of the breakdown of the department, basically where each uh, person uh, lives in terms of the chain of command. And it kind of lets you uh, see and understand where, uh, where the police department uh, has personnel uh, broken down. So the command structure is, uh, is the chief. So she's at the top and that's followed by uh, the commanders. Myself and Commander Rogers are the two commanders over each division. The lady in that photo there with Commander Rogers, he's, he's really good at doing selfies. So he gets selfies all the time. That's uh, Brandy Leos. She's actually in human resources and you'll hear from her uh, next month, uh, next month. Yes, in a couple of sessions when we talk about our hiring process because uh, as you'll find, and this is uh, uh, the best for best practice, HR handles a, a significant portion of our hiring process in order to keep it as, uh, as transparent as possible. So uh, you'll hear from her how that, uh, how that works and what that looks like. Uh, the next uh, level in our chain of command is our lieutenants. So we have three lieutenants. There's one in my division, and then there's two in uh, two in the patrol division or two in the operations division. And they're responsible for different things. So uh, when, when we talk about lieutenants, they're the watch commanders. They are the ones that make sure that the day-to-day -day operations are covered. So they're responsible. One of them is, is responsible for uh, day shift and night shift currently. 
And then the other one is responsible for our afternoon shift and then any of our specialty teams. So when I talked about our traffic team, our community service officers, um, our canine teams, things like that, that lieutenant is, is in charge of all of those. And when I say in charge of them, it basically means that they're responsible for making sure that all of the metrics for training are being hit, that they uh, are coordinating any uh, equipment that might need to be purchased for those special teams, things like that. So they're, they're a, they carry a big role in terms of the efficiency of the organization and making sure that things continue to roll as, as they need to. The next and, and really uh, probably, uh, gosh, Without sergeants, we, we couldn't operate as a department. Uh, the top sergeant there, Sergeant Erickson, he's currently our traffic sergeant. He uh, has been with us for, oh my gosh, a long time. <laughs> he's been a sergeant for about 10 years. And um, he, uh, he actually has a degree in like astrophysics or something. No, I don't know if it's that. It's something like, like rocket science, literally type of thing. Um, anyway, uh, uh, Lee is, uh, he's our traffic sergeant currently. And so he's uh, got that responsibility. And then they're the one on the bottom, that's uh, Sergeant Rivera. And he was one of our canine handlers uh, and he got promoted a little bit less than a year ago. And uh, uh, Savi actually is, uh, um, he grew up in a family where uh, English is his second language. So he, he's from, or his parents are from Puerto Rico. And so he is uh, fluent in Spanish and it's, he's a, he's an incredibly great guy. And if you have met our chief in person, she's not small. Uh, she played basketball in college. So, um, and she's pretty tall. That gives you the idea about how big Savi is. He's, he's a, he's a uh, strapping young man. And then uh, here's the, these are the men and women of, of our organization here that really make the magic happen. Um, the officers, the ones that are out on the street, the ones that if you call 911, these are the, these are the people that are going to show up. They're the ones that, that uh, really make what we do happen. So the officers there on the top, that's uh, Officer Fink on the left. He actually started with us as a cadet and he uh, came back to us as a police officer. So we've, we've had him with us for quite some time. And he is uh, really, really fun to see somebody come through your program as a cadet, as a, as a teen. And then to see them come through and develop as an officer has been really fun to watch him over the years that he's been here. And then with him in that photo is Officer Bunyavath. That's common spelling. Um, and uh, she has been with us for a couple of years now. And she actually is pretty small, but she plays rugby. Uh, so she's she may be small, but she's mighty. And on the bottom there, that's, oh, sorry, I had to look at it close. Officer Imus and Officer Keller. Uh, Brian was one of our SROs until last year, and now he's back in patrol. He's been with us for well over 10 years, and then April has been with us for over 20 years. Uh, they're out there doing bike patrol, and uh, that's, that's one of the things that we try to do when the weather's decent and we have enough staffing to be able to do it. We send our, our officers out um, to do patrol, bike patrols. So a little bit more, we uh, talking about what the structure looks like. We have uniformed patrol, we have detectives, and then also uh, the one there, that's uh, an academy graduation uh, during COVID actually, because, and most of these photos were actually taken pre-COVID, just as the, uh, since we have to talk about that now, pre-COVID, but that the academy graduation there, that was the cameos the, that they do for the grad or for the academy currently. So the officer there on the left, that's Officer Enzenberger. He's uh, been with us for 15 years at least. And then Officer Brett there, he graduated from the academy last summer. And then Detective Stone, actually he's back in patrol now. He was one of our commercial crimes unit detectives for four years. We do rotations on some of our detectives. 
And I'll talk a little bit more about that here uh, in a couple minutes. So we have non-sworn staff as well. So the, the police officers I just showed you are sworn staff, and then we have non-sworn staff. So our evidence technicians, they are non-sworn. Uh, the biggest difference is, is they, they don't do law enforcement. Uh, they don't have a law enforcement capacity. So they, they don't uh, carry a firearm. They can't make arrests, things like that. That's the, that's the biggest difference there. But they make a huge impact on the department. So the processing of evidence, uh, community service officers, which are some of the, they're men and women that are in the field that can do uh, certain things. They can enforce certain municipal codes and they really help us to, to further the mission of not only the police department, but the city as a whole. And it really fills a gap between the high priority law enforcement calls and then the ones that we really that we really don't need to send a police officer to, but it still needs to have some level of attention from the police department. So let's say maybe parking complaints. If uh, somebody calls in a parking complaint or an abandoned vehicle, it's almost always gonna be a community service officer that goes and takes care of it. It's not something that we need to send a police officer to do. The reality is, is police officers are, um, are expensive. And uh, if we have a community service officer that can go take those lower priority calls, we'll send the, the CSO to do that. And then on the uh, right photo there is our record staff. So the records staff is really like the checks and balances of the police department. They are the ones that are processing any reports that come in, any requests for information that, that comes through. They are checking uh, quality control to assist us with making sure that we are, that we're doing the best quality work uh, turning in the best quality work that we can. Most of our reports are done uh, electronically and stored on the cloud now, but there are always paper documents that go with it. So our staff uh, processes those and they, uh, they keep all that stuff organized for us. And then when we make mistakes, and we do, then they are there to catch that before we uh, before we let that ship sail. Because the last thing you wanna do is, is send information maybe out to the district attorney's office when an officer has made an arrest and it's sent out incomplete. So they're checking for the completeness to make sure that everything is, is there before maybe they forward a record to the district attorney's office. That way then it, it uh, helps to keep that efficiency as high as possible. So in the chief's division, the administrative division, uh, it's the chief's office. Uh, so the chief has uh, has an executive assistant in there, and her executive assistant is actually, uh, uh, you know, there for the entire the entire uh, police department, and we we do all lean on her. Uh, the chief also directly oversees the public information officer, uh, the community engagement specialist, and the business manager. So they all report directly to the chief. So any anytime you see the police department releasing a uh, press release, things like that. Those are going through the chief's office and through the public information officer. <clears throat> so a little bit about the city of Tigard to, to give you some context. So the city is 12 square miles and there on the left side of the screen, you see that uh, section that's, that's uh, got the purple line around it, that's River Terrace. And it's actually pretty much separated almost entirely from the rest of the city by a good portion of Bull Mountain, which is unincorporated Washington County. So part of that is covered by the sheriff's office, but then the part that's inside the purple box over there and then as well as on the right side of your screen is the city of Tigard. So it complicates a little bit for us how we staff this patrolling wise in terms of where we where resources have to come from and go to. So we really concentrate on trying to make sure that we can get our uh, response times down as low as possible. And that's one of the things that we talked about in the levy that we're working towards. And so geography complicates that for, for us because of the because of where some parts of the city are at. Some parts of the city are more difficult to get to than others. Some parts of the city are more challenging to get to at certain times of the day as well. So we try and allocate our staffing resources based on 
what time of day it is and maybe what part of the city has the highest amount of calls. So we actually use data to show us where we might be best served placing our resources during the day, especially for patrol resources. So the nighttime population or the people that call Tiger home is around 55,000 ish, maybe, maybe a little bit more than that based on the, the current census data, but close enough to 55,000. The big thing that changes is during the day, we pop up to over 100,000 people. And the reason for that is, is we have some, uh, we have a couple of large retail centers in the, in the city. So Bridgeport Village and Washington Square Mall are at least part in the city. Interesting about Bridgeport Village is part of that uh, mall is in the city of Tigard. Part of it is in Tualatin. And when they were building it, initially there was some conversation about maybe having the city limits run but like down the middle of some of the businesses. And of course there was complications on a variety of levels for that. So it actually, the, the city limits is the roadway that runs in front of the theater there. And so like, for instance, the theater, California Pizza Kitchen is in the city of Tigard. And then like the Apple store, which is across the street is in the city of Tualatin. So fortunately we have uh, a pretty well-defined delineation between the, between the two. So there's three highways. Uh, Interstate 5, obviously, which is a huge uh, connector from Canada to Mexico. A ton of traffic comes up and down that to include illicit activity. And that, uh, that can be seen on a variety of scales. Highway 217 is a state highway that runs through uh, kind of the northeast part of the city. And then Highway 99, which really carries just tons of traffic as, as well, tons of traffic, as you all well know, but so many people that commute to the Portland metro area from places like McMinnville, Newburgh, people that are heading to the, to the Oregon coast come down Highway 99 very commonly. So those, uh, those different highways create a different dynamic for us uh, policing the city. Probably, Probably one of the most uh, important things to understand about why that impacts us is Highway 217 is something that if we have a crash on that, we respond to it. Interstate 5, we try to have Oregon State Police do it, but oftentimes they are unavailable or they're so far away that it doesn't make sense for people in the community to have to wait for the state troopers to show up. So we do end up taking crashes and calls out on Interstate 5 as well. So those, those three highways create an interesting dynamic, especially when you have regular traffic volumes because it makes it more challenging to get around the city. It, it significantly complicates the way that we allocate our staffing resources uh, in a time when you don't have COVID. We have schools and we have school resource officers and We'll talk about it a little bit more as we get deeper into our sessions because we're working on some stuff with the school district currently. But we have a high school, a couple of middle schools, uh, grade schools that are part of the district, but then there's also uh, many private schools in the city as well. So those, uh, those bring a, a different dynamic to us as well. And then we have a variety of parks, 10 plus parks in the city that are all part of what we what we patrol. So let's talk a little bit about staffing levels. So we have, well, I've put an asterisk next to these because that's what ideally if we're at full staffing and uh, I'll talk a little bit about it right here. One of the questions that was asked uh, that came in from community comment was asking about how we're doing on hiring for, for uh, the levy. And we're just about full. We've just about hired for all of those positions. We've got one levy position left to hire for. We have two people that have upcoming start dates that are both on the levy. 
And then we have a whole bunch of people at various levels of training. Some of the people that we were able to hire uh, shortly after July 1st have uh, hit the road and are patrolling on a solo status now. So we've, we've been very successful in, in hiring a lot of people and training a lot of people. Our coaches have been doing a fantastic job and quite honestly have got to be very tired of, of training new officers at this point in the game. Uh, Commander, we had a question um, come in about the previous slide. Um, if you wouldn't mind going back. I can go back, yes. Jeff Mott asks, um, any idea what percentage of your calls are traffic related? Oh boy, you know, Jeff, I, the, that's a good question. I, I would have to look up what the percentage is. I can tell you this, that of the, of the complaints that we get, or I shouldn't say complaints, but the, the requests that we get for say extra patrol, the vast majority of issues that come to us as a department, they come in as, uh, it comes in as traffic complaints. So that's why we have a traffic team that addresses those. But in terms of, I guess, are you asking about like traffic crashes or go, go ahead and, and, and unmute and, and ask, I wanna make sure I get it right. Yeah, thank you. It, um, it's just, it's a lot of major roadways to cover, you know, a lot of ground to cover. And so I was just curious about, um, and you're going into resources by each team, but just curious how much of time and money is spent on traffic related things. And I tried to look on the, uh, like the monthly dashboard and couldn't find anything specifically. So that's why I was curious. Yeah, you know, it's not a huge percentage of of what we do in terms of what it takes us in, in, in percentage of calls, but those traffic teams or the traffic team we have is, is proactive. So when we have complaints in, in a neighborhood, they focus their efforts in those neighborhoods, or we work with our engineering department to maybe do a traffic survey in a neighborhood to see if we can figure out what the speeds are, if there's certain times of the day that are worse than others. And then we focus our efforts at those, at those focused times. So that if we know that one neighborhood has a problem in the morning, then they go work that in the morning and another neighborhood has more of a problem in the afternoon, they go work that one in the afternoon to try and balance those out to get some compliance through enforcement. So traffic crashes, I'd have to look it up. I don't remember what the, uh, it's as a percentage, it's a pretty low percentage of our total number of calls, but it, the traffic crashes take a significant amount of time because you're on the call for an extended period of time. It takes a pretty good amount of time to write the report. So things like that. And, and a lot of times it just takes a lot of time to clear the crashes because damaged vehicles have to be towed out of the way. And sometimes it can take an hour for a tow truck to arrive. And then the traffic uh, residual traffic problem from that is what you all see. And you're like, what is going on here? I mean, traffic's already horrible in Tigard. And then uh, and then a crash just makes it that much worse. So um, in terms of percentage of calls, it's a pretty low percentage. I can find that out for you. I'm going to write it down um, because it, it wouldn't be that hard to, to figure out. And um, and I can report back on it. Awesome. And, uh, we, Thank you. Thank hey, you. Commander. Yeah. Just looking at last year's uh, or 2018 there were 1,700 crashes, 1,779 crashes. And in 2019, we had 1,771 total crash calls. So right around 1,700 a year. See, it, it helps having somebody that knows how to look it up really quick <laughs> like that on the call with us. So as a percentage total of our calls, we had what, like 40,000 calls in a year. So it's, it's a percentage, but it's a lower percentage, right? Uh, so, but it, the thing is, is it takes a significant amount of our time and it's kind of been a little bit of a wrestling match at times with, uh, with like state police. But the problem with state police is they just don't have the staffing. Their staffing is, has, has just been nothing but reduced and reduced and reduced over the years. So they just really don't have the troopers to, to respond most of the time. So we end up, we end up taking those. And uh, commander on the same slide, we've got a question from Abdi. He's asking, um, which elementary schools are included, I think, in the six, and do they have SROs assigned? We don't have them 
we don't have like an actual SRO that goes to the school every day. So it's a, it's a collateral assignment of the SROs that we have. So for example, Officer Maring, who was our middle school SRO, he also would go to the grade schools if they, if they were called there or uh, if we had a presentation to be done or something like that. Uh, so we don't have we don't have an SRO specifically that goes to the schools on a regular basis to check in. When I was an SRO, that was different. We actually taught the DARE program. And so we were in the grade schools on a regular basis teaching the DARE program. And I actually had part of my assignment was a couple of grade schools that were that were actually assigned to me. And I would make regular visits to those schools and go eat lunch with the kids and shoot hoops on the playground and things like that. And so it, it was really pretty great. Um, and uh, which elementary schools are included in those that six? OK, you're testing me, aren't you? I, I'm not. <laughs> So um, let's see, uh, Durham, CF Tigard, Mary Woodward. You're gonna make me look at my map, just a second. What's the one on Bull Mountain? Alberta uh, Ryder and Metzger. Alberta, Alberta Ryder, Metzger. Thank you. Metzger, Alberta Ryder. Yeah. Uh, Templeton, <laughs> did I get six? I think I, I was counting on my fingers. <laughs> You're testing me. Um, yeah, so those are the six elementaries that uh, that would be included in that. And then Fowler and Tuality are their two middle schools. I, I got those. Great. So. I think we have more questions coming in, but yeah. that is all for right now. Yeah, let, let's let's do it. No, um, they're still typing. Oh, that's so it. You, okay. You continue. Yes. Okay. Okay, we talked a little bit about patrol. So that number of 46, that would be an ideal, um, gosh, I guess, perfect world scenario. If we had nobody hurt, nobody on extended leave, nobody on military leave, all of our officers trained and not in any level of field training or at the academy or anything like that, we would have 46 officers that work patrol. Currently, and you know what, this number actually might not be accurate as of today. I think it's actually 29. I put 30 as my note here, but I think it's actually 29 that are available to actually be working, um, working patrol. So 46 is the total number that we could have, but because we have so many in ver so many officers in various levels of training, we have officers that are injured or on extended, uh, extended leave for whatever reason, a medical reason, or off or officers that are deployed. We have, you know, I told you Officer Gregston just got back from a deployment. We have another officer that's getting ready to be deployed at the end of March. He's going to be deployed for a year. So we'll uh, you'll we'll lose him for a year to his to his deployment. Uh, canine officers, we actually do have three canine officers currently. Uh, that one there is is diesel. And the smile on his face actually really does reflect the personality of that dog. He's a really, he's just a really personable dog. I mean, granted, you probably wouldn't want him chasing you, but um, he is, he's a, just a fantastic animal. And so we've got, we have three of them and our, our newest one, Cooper, just became uh, certified uh, last week. So he can actually go do his, his, uh, go do some tracks. So that's, that's a good, that's a good bonus and a good addition to the team. So the traffic team, which I, you got to see Sergeant Erickson, and you're going to get to meet him uh, when we talk about body worn cameras in our next session. So Sergeant Erickson will be here for that. We also have three motors positions. We currently only have two filled because one of our one of our officers retired back in November. Officer Morse uh, retired after well well twenty five plus years with with our department. So he retired and actually moved to Texas and took a police job down in Texas. I think he wanted to have it be warmer. And jokes on him because they're going to get really cold and snowy down there where he lives now this week as well. So he. Uh, 
he retired. And if you've ever gotten a traffic citation from a motorcycle officer in Tiger, it was probably Officer Morse. Uh, he was very, he was very good and very efficient at his job. And then uh, we have the two community service officers that I talked about before. And then kind of talking, touching a little bit on the patrol uh, supervisor structure, we have the two lieutenants and then we have six sergeants. So we have, we run three shifts and I'll just move forward to that. Uh, we have three shifts and we always have a supervisor on duty. It's best practice. There's always a sergeant or a lieutenant. Occasionally they'll have a commander, but they don't probably really trust us to, <laughs> to be as, as good and as well practiced as the sergeants are. So typically it's a sergeant, almost, almost always. And so we have three separate shifts, uh, days, afternoons, and nights, or days, swings, and graveyard is what we call them, to make sure that we have 24-hour coverage. And one of the things that we really focus on doing is we, we work on having an overlap so during that overlap, you'll have more officers. So for example, day shift starts at seven o'clock in the morning, goes till 5 p.m. All of our, all of our patrol officers work four tens uh, each week. Swing shift comes on at 2 p.m. So from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., we have two shifts working. And what this does is it does a few things. It provides us an opportunity for the day shift officers to come in and write reports that maybe they've taken during the day and we still have that coverage out on the road. Maybe they have some follow-up that needs to be done. Maybe a swing shift officer has some follow-up that needs to be done. They can do it at the front end of their shift and try and get that when we have basically two shifts working. So we have that extra load of officers during that time. The other thing is, is that during that time frame, that two, it's actually from about uh, noon until 6 p.m. is our highest call volume time of the day. So now, in addition to having that overlap for officers to be able to get work done, they now have uh, that extra time or and those extra officers during that time when we have that extra call load there. And then over on the right side of the screen, you see the minimum staffing numbers. So in the last slide, I showed you that 46 is the number that would be the, the ideally that we would have assigned to patrol. And then you would ask me, well, why do you only have three or four officers as your minimum staffing? Well, when you when I said 46, but then I actually said that only 29 are available to actually be working because of injuries and training and everything like that. And then we have additional training that for update training, because there is huge amounts of training that we have to that we have to do for not only for state certifications, but also because we have a bit of a higher standard here in Tigard. We don't just use the state minimum as, as our landing point for training. We have a higher standard than that. We don't, uh, we don't just stick to the, if they say you need eight hours of this, that we do just the eight hours and call it good. We, we know that our community has a higher expectation than that. And therefore we train to a higher expectation and we have a higher expectation of our officers as well. So when you take uh, into account being able to give people time off, uh, the training that has to be done, people that are injured or, or sick, this is our minimum staffing. And very often we are very close to that minimum staffing, which was one of the biggest reasons that we, that we, ask for that levy because when we're at minimum staffing, it makes it really difficult for us to be able to get to high priority calls in an efficient amount of time, in the amount of time that we should be getting there. All right, I'm gonna briefly hit the hiring process. Commander, a uh, question yeah. before we go into the hiring process, we've got a question about recruitment. So maybe before hiring, let's talk recruitment. Um, where do you recruit? Um, is it colleges, for your colleges, community colleges, other police departments? Is it something we're doing regionally, nationally, statewide, or just local? Yes. <laughs> All of those things. Actually, um, Jamie, if I can just interrupt for just a second. Certainly. Just, just a reminder for everybody, this is just the high level. We're going to go in each category and go into the weeds. So when you're talking about recruitment, recruitment, the whole process, we'll get into that. This is just how we're broken down and 
And so there'll be different speakers that will really come in with the numbers, um, but this is just supposed to be the overview. Yeah, thanks chief. And actually that's what I, that was something I was gonna hit on because that's something that Brandy from our human resources, she's gonna hit on, on that because they have a variety of, of areas that HR helps us with recruiting. So yeah, we're gonna get, we're gonna dig deep into that because everything that, that was mentioned there, yes, we hit and then others as well. And Brandy's going to be prepared to talk about that. And that, and what that does is it helps us to get that, that depth and that breadth of, of applicants that will allow us to select the very best people possible to serve this community. Thank you. And then um, we also have several questions about some specific breakdown um, information and um, we'll back to you, uh, back to the board with that information or pass it on to you and Brandy for your um, hiring uh, presentation later on. So we won't ask those tonight. Oh, okay. Like breakdown as in? Uh, ethnic racial breakdown oh, of officers, gender breakdown of officers, et cetera. Oh yeah, Brandy will be bringing that when we talk about uh, like what our current staff is. Yes, yes, yes. current staff. Yeah, we'll, we'll have all of that. Uh, we'll have all that when we do the, the hiring and recruiting part here in a few weeks. Yep. Thank you. So here's a little bit about the hiring process. And I just, I wanted to put up just a quick, a quick slide that talks a little bit about it because of how complex it is to actually get hired and the amount of time that it takes, because it isn't, it isn't just this quick, uh, Hey, come on in. We, we got your application. Let's come in and do an interview. Hey, can you start next Monday? If I were to take a written test today, it's February. If everything went absolutely as smooth as possible, I might be starting in September or October because that's how long it takes for our process to be as comprehensive as possible. Because it isn't just about putting in an application saying, hey, we like you and then giving you the job. It's very comprehensive, it's long-term, and that's why we're gonna spend a full session talking about the hiring and the background process, recruiting, and those types of things, because it is very complex. And we, I, I feel it's important that you all understand how that works and you have the opportunity to ask in-depth questions about how we do it, because it's it's your police department and, and it's important that you understand and maybe you can give me some suggestions that we can incorporate into our process to make us better. And we will get, we will get into the weeds, like the chief said, talking about that stuff, because we look for men and women that reflect the core values of this organization, which are attitude, leadership, integrity, service, and teamwork. And you have to meet all of those when we, at every point in the process, or you're not the right fit for the organization. Uh, on the right side there, the swearing in ceremony, that is two, two new officers that, well, you can tell that wasn't pre-COVID. They were getting sworn in with their masks on. That is uh, Michael uh, Schumacher on the left side there. He just graduated from the academy last Thursday, and he had his first day, I think, with Nick. Is he with you right now? Yeah, he's a yeah, so he, First day he, was today. Well, yeah, he's, it was yesterday, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... Uh, so Michael is assigned to Officer Nunn. He's uh, Officer Nunn is his coach, and he just started yesterday in his field training process. So he's got he's got a few months of training left before he gets to go out on his own. We'll talk about that uh, as we move through later sessions. And then the the lady on the right there that is uh, Erica Carballo. She came to us as a lateral officer from Hawaii. And she is a drug recognition expert, which is something that is becoming more and more important because uh, a drug recognition expert is used when someone is suspected of driving under the influence and it's not alcohol. So they have very, very specialized and very in-depth training on how to do that. So she's been with us not even a year yet, and she is a really great addition to the to the organization. She's a little bit uh, surprised at our cold winter and she has no idea what's coming later this week. Coming from Hawaii, she has a rude awakening coming later this week, I think. So um, 
she said she's never driven in snow before, so she just might get to do that this week. Uh, we'll, in two weeks, we'll report back on how that goes. Okay, so just a quick overview on field training for new officers. So you see, you saw Officer uh, Schumacher there. He is about midway through that 10 month uh, journey. He just got done with his 16 weeks at the academy, and then he's got the the 20 weeks of field training in front of him, a minimum of 20 weeks. And when we talk about our field training process in depth later, we'll talk about what differentiates our organization from other organizations. We have a very unique way that we do it that can provide focused training if an officer is struggling in a certain area. And it's not something that is generally, you don't generally see that very much in, in police agencies today, but we'll talk a lot about that when we talk about field training, because it's really important that, that people understand how, how we do things differently, because it, it really is, it, it's important that we train people in every area, especially if they're showing an area of deficiency, rather than just either overlooking it, which would be, could be horrible, or letting them go, because by this point, we've already got probably a year of time into most of these these app or most of these officers and the last thing we want to do is see them go down the road if it's something that can be corrected so out on the road we're talking about calls for service there's a variety of different different things that we do out on the road we respond to emergency and non-emergency calls for service Emergency meaning those are the lights and sirens ones. When you see an officer driving lights and sirens, it's actually a small percentage of the calls that we respond to. The priority ones and twos are your life safety or a, an in-progress property type call, things like that. Those all go through the Washington County Consolidated Communications Agency or WACA. So the, the county has a singular dispatch service for the entire county. They dispatch for all the police agencies in the county and all and for Hillsborough Fire, Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue. They actually dispatch for Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue in Yamhill County and in Clackamas County because TVFNR reaches into those counties as well. So that's all done out of our uh, call or out of the countywide uh, 911 center. So they do that for everyone. And we use Computers. So in the, I guess in the middle left there, Officer Bunyavath, you can see your computer in the background there. Most of the calls that we get come through the computer. They don't generally, you know, the low priority ones don't come in over the, don't come in over the radio. Generally it's dispatched through the, the computer. And then the officers respond to it like that. It might be, they might make a phone call. They might, they might have to respond to someone's address, but the vast majority of calls that our officers get are not running lights and sirens to them and they're not being dispatched over the radio. And then of course they're prioritized based upon lights, life safety or property damage, if it's in progress, things like that. So uh, it's, it's, there's a fine, there's a fine balance of how those calls come in and then it's prioritized. So the high priority ones obviously get taken first and then the lower priority ones, if, you know, there might be a bunch of those that stack up. So if you've ever had to call in, call the non-emergency number for, you know, whatever it might be, your car was, uh, your car got broken into and something was stolen out of it. It's not an in-progress call. So it's a lower priority. And if the officers were on in-progress type calls or it's a life safety call or a, say a traffic crash, those are going to be higher priority calls than say the vehicle that was broken into and had some items stolen out of it. So it might take us an extended period of time to respond to that particular call. So we also do self-initiated activities, a variety of different things that we do. The one there on the left is a, is a camp uh, where some homeless folks were living. Uh, public outreach, that's uh, one of the one of the events that we participate in, in normal times, and that's one of the biggest challenges we've had is we don't really get to do too many community events. And there's Officer Powers and Diesel again at the Rotary Club doing a presentation. You can see Diesel, he's just kind of hanging out. Somebody's, he's 
actually probably waiting to get his Kong from Mike and he knows that that's his treat. So he's behaving himself in that photo. So some of the community events that we participate in, this is, this is what it's all about right here is getting the opportunity to, to work with the community, to be out there and sharing what we do as an organization. And then hearing back from the community, what it is you're looking for from us. We can do things like, you know, the Festival of Balloons, you've probably seen us at, 4th of July. Now, granted, these are all in a non-COVID world, right? National Night Out, which National Night Out, if, you've, if you haven't participated in it, I'm, that's something I'll encourage you to participate in in the future. It's a fantastic way to get to know your neighbors, to work with them. The police department, uh, the fire department, we come out, we try to attend every one of those different events around the city on that night. It's, it's the first, first Tuesday in August each year in uh, normal circumstances. So I would encourage you when that when we start getting closer to that, I'll remind everyone, it's an excellent event to be able to go out. You can build some awesome relationships with people in your neighborhood. So anyway, other things that we do like Christmas tree lighting, the Halloween downtown, that's what the chief's doing there. She, the one in the lower second from the left is a one of our young community members that was dressed up in a SWAT uniform. So the, the chief had to get a picture with uh with him so anyhow all kinds of different things that we like to be able to do i'll talk really quickly about our our equipment that we use so patrol vehicles almost exclusively we use the ford explorer anymore the reason is, is it's just an excellent platform it's pretty darn fuel efficient it provides enough space for us with all of our equipment when we are when we're in uniform with all of our equipment with our duty vest or our, our ballistic vest our duty gear all of that stuff you really are a lot bigger than than you would just be without any of that so having enough space is also really important the chevy tahoe we actually have one of those left it's a supervisor vehicle and part of that reason is because our supervisors carry a bunch of additional equipment that we might need in a in a critical a critical incident, a critical situation, mountain bikes, motorcycles, things like that. MDCs are the computers that are in the cars, cameras. So we have in-car video systems, and I'm just going to give you a little teaser for our next session. And then we have a limited deployment of body-worn cameras. Our motorcycle officers wear body-worn cameras because they can't have a dash-mounted system like we do in all of our patrol cars. And our dash cam system for our, our patrol vehicles is end of life too. We've had, I mean, you know how fast technology advances and our our in-car system is is at least 13 years old so you can imagine how far the technology has come in the last 13 years in video systems i don't i bet most people here don't have a tv that's 13 years old so uh it's it is a it's an end of life system but more to come on that in a couple of weeks so our motors wear body cams our canine officers wear body cams and our SROs also have body cams. And then some of the, uh, a couple of our, our officers that work in the field have also been trained on the use of the body cams. And when there's, when cameras are available, they also grab those. Our staff is highly supportive of them. And then uh, automatic license plate readers. Those are, those are handy because uh, it can pop up if you drive past. We have a couple of vehicles that are equipped with those. So that isn't the, it isn't something that we would put on all of our vehicles, but those can uh, tell you if there's a stolen vehicle that might have been seen. Uh, let's say we have a high profile crime and we can run the plate of the vehicle of, uh, associated with that crime and we could it would give us history of maybe if that vehicle had been captured on one of the ALPR systems. So in support services, this is the non-uniformed basically. Here's a little bit of the structure. We've got a lieutenant, three sergeants, and a non-sworn supervisor. The non-sworn supervisor is our record supervisor. The sergeants are the commercial crimes unit, the criminal investigations unit, and then professional standards. And so commercial crimes and uh, criminal investigations are two, those are our, our detective units. So commercial crimes unit investigates crimes 
where almost exclusively businesses have been the victims of those crimes. And that unit is supported through funding with business license fees. So businesses actually pay for that and they get three detectives and uh, the sergeant. So uh, they do uh, most of those. For example, uh, the, well, the riots that we had uh, uh, back in, in January, that's assigned to a commercial crimes unit uh, detective, actually two detectives in there are working on that because we had a bunch of uh, businesses that sustained damage as a result of that. So they have that case. About a week and a half ago, we had a homicide in the city and the criminal investigations unit is, is responsible for that. And then along those lines, we also participate with the major crimes team, Washington County major crimes team. And in a high profile event, we could, we could call on the resources of, of that team to assist us if we needed it. But uh, this most recent homicide, our, our team is, is handling it almost exclusively. And then the professional standards sergeant is a reasonably, well, very new position. It started in January. And that person is responsible for conducting our internal investigations that have any level of complexity to them. And then also for reviewing training, making sure that our training is being done and kept up to speed like it's supposed to be. And also, he also is going to be doing a lot of the review of any use of force that we might have as an organization. So you're going to hear more from him. His name is Monty Fox. He's been with us for over 20 years. He just finished his, his tour as the criminal investigation sergeant, very tenured as a sergeant, and he's really really identifying some opportunities for us to improve, especially in our training areas. We're already strong there, but he's he's really working hard to, to bolster what our training looks like in the, in the coming months. So fantastic. It's a fantastic addition for us because it's really helping us to identify blind spots for the organization. We'll talk I, about our three may commercial. May, oh yeah. May, may I make just one more comment? Absolutely. And, and it really is to the, the rest of the board members. The, this is a, um, a pilot program, professional standards sergeant. I had one in Tacoma. Uh, obviously, Tacoma is a much larger agency. But again, as Jamie alluded to, to really have that eye on use of force thoroughly, uh, you know, to really become very proficient because we don't usually have the the volume of internal affairs investigations uh, accreditation standards all of that so what i hope to do i have six months because it is a, a temporarily funded position i'm using a vacancy for it i hope to come back to the board and talk about what we were able to do in this first six months and how does that fit within the vision or possibly the recommendations that this board makes up. So um, I, I look forward to probably uh, six months from now coming to you with what we were able to do with this position. So I just wanna put that on uh, a tickler for down the road because it is not a permanent position. This is just a pilot. Yeah, thanks, Chief. I, I neglected to mention that. So yeah, perfect. Good catch. Uh, the One of the others, uh, we have a specially assigned detective, meaning outsourced to to another, another jurisdiction or another uh, organization. And then one, I didn't even put her on here, and this is horrible of me, I should have done this, is our crime analyst. So our crime analyst is, she's the one that really helps us to identify areas she does a bunch of different things, but one of them is that's really critical is helping us to identify areas where we have issues or problems that we might need to focus efforts in. So using that data that we collect from crime trends or statistics that we get there and then putting that to work on the street. And she's the one that really helps us do that. I can't believe I forgot to put her on my slide. It just it just popped into my brain as we were sitting here, but she is one of the critical support roles in the organization that really, honestly, we wouldn't be able to be nearly as effective with the number of people that we have if we didn't have a crime analyst helping us to digest that data and then tell us, hey, don't worry about patrolling over here. This isn't your problem. This is your problem over here. 
let's focus resources there. So that way we can send more resources. It doesn't mean that this part of the city gets nothing. It just means that this one gets more and more focused to address an issue and be able to take care of that. And then we talked a little bit about records, property and evidence. And then in uh, detectives area, we do have one admin assistant. She actually really helps uh, to coordinate the, the paperwork end of the training that I was talking about that, that Sergeant Fox is doing. She does a lot of that stuff. She assists our detectives when, when they have complex investigations and we need to have interviews transcribed. She does a transcription for that. Very, very complex uh, work that she does and she makes it look very simple. So uh, really important, really important role there as well. So back in May, we, you, the voters passed a local option levy if my screen will move forward. Uh oh, well, we can talk about it a little bit. <laughs> Anyway, the, the local option levy funded additional staffing and took effect back in in uh, July 1st of 2020. It was eight patrol officers and an additional school resource officer. So we were, like I said earlier, we're almost done filling those. It's also going to provide department-wide advanced crisis intervention training and then any of the associated equipment that goes along with the hiring of these of these new officers. So I don't know why my commander. Um, I've got the PowerPoint up. If you want me to share my screen, yeah. If you want to, uh, I can go off of sharing. We've only got a couple of slides left, but I can take control. You're good at doing that. Yeah. Did I stop sharing? Uh, I made you stop sharing. Oh, thanks. <laughs> So we're on the option levy slide. Yeah, so I gotta move my stuff here. Yeah, I kind of covered all of that stuff. Does anybody have any questions about the local option levy? So uh, the next thing is talk a little bit about the budget because the reality is uh, we can't do our job without the budget. So we build our budget on, on, on these types of things, on what council goals are, on what, uh, what community survey priorities are, the, you know, the department vision and values. So I talked about our core values. And so when we talk about our budget, it really with everything that we do, not just the budget, when we hire people, when we go out into the community to do community outreach, when we build our budget, it's all about trying to meet these different things, meet the city council goals, meet what the the priorities of the community are. What are the what's the vision and the values of the organization? Uh, input from a chief's advisory panel or from the public safety advisory board. So those are the types of things that that we look for. And then also what our operational needs are. When it comes down to what can we do with the staffing that we have, that's where we if we if we find an area that we're deficient, then that's something and we can't make an adjustment within where our current budget is. That's when we have to go to council and ask for additional funding. That's why you saw the the uh, local option levy is because we we really needed to we needed to get better. We needed to be able to respond in a more timely manner. We needed to provide a better level of service to the community and we just hadn't been able to keep up on it over the years. So uh, you can move on to the next one there, Kim. So we identify budget opportunities in a variety of different ways. So, you know, some of the opportunities that we have is, you know, field training officer class. You see that we're, we're training officers how to be field training officers. And that's expensive because you have to take all those people off the road, but it pays off in dividends down the road. Training. Training is complex. You're gonna hear more and more about that. You're gonna get an opportunity at points later in our training sessions to experience some of the training that we, that we do. We're gonna give you an opportunity to come in and socially distanced, but set up a time to come in with one of our instructors or a handful of our instructors and be able to be exposed to some of the training that our officers get an opportunity to go through. 
and it'll it'll give you a different perspective than maybe you've had before. And then, for example, one of the other things that could be an opportunity would be a, a partnership with TriMet. We don't currently have that partnership going, but we have in the past. We're evaluating whether or not it's something that's appropriate for the city to be in, to be involved with. And so those are the types of things that we look at as we work through our budgeting. All right, you can go to the last slide there, Kim. And I just wanted to see if anybody has any questions at this point. I just want to reiterate also what the chief said earlier, and she said it in the chat, is that we, we are collecting all of the questions. There were some that were very detailed about specific volumes of calls in different areas, um, the uh, racial breakdown of, and gender breakdown of officers in the department. Um, and all of that information um, will be shared, if not get some communication, at, definitely in a future presentation and incorporated. Um, so Yeah, I guess I will just say thank you. And this last slide right here, I think is a really good representation of the men and women in our organization. The blurred one there is kind of fun. He's one of our new canine officers and you can't see his dog because it's kind of behind the other pictures there. But Officer Suyama is an exciting, fun young man that is really uh, doing a great job with his, with his new dog. And then in the middle there, that's Officer Davis and Officer Bunyavath again. Officer Davis has been with us for well over 20 years. He's a patrol officer. And then in the upper right there with the scouts, that's Officer Furry. He's actually the one that just had his canine get certified. So he's got a, a new dog. And then there in the lower right, oh, my screen's too small to see them all. But a group of our, a group of our men and women uh, wearing, one, wearing the hats during Breast Cancer Awareness Month here a couple of years ago. And uh, just kind of giving you an idea of what the, of some of the people that, that are out there serving you in the community. So thank you. If there's no other questions, I mean, I'll be here for the rest of the night. If any questions pop up, happy to, happy to answer. Uh, thank you very much, Commander. You bet. So we're gonna move into our next um, agenda piece. And if you do have any questions that come to you um, afterwards, please feel free to email um, them to um, Eduardo and we'll make sure that they get forwarded to whoever they, they need to go to and incorporate it into to further discussion. So um, I know not everybody processes in the moment in the same way. So that is an option that you have. Um, moving into the next, um, segment, we are going to elect our first chair and vice chair. So just to recap, uh, let me find um, that presentation. We discussed uh, last week um, and um, at the first meeting what the organization of the board was going to look like. And so just to, to remind everybody, um, we are electing a chair and vice chair. Usually it'll be two weeks before the beginning of the next subunit. We're a little off schedule because this is the first one and we're starting the subunit next week. Uh, the chair and vice chair have the equal authority to the other members. They will have general directional powers over the board and they'll serve as spokesperson for the board during their term, unless that responsibility can, is delegated, which it can be to support staff or another board member. Uh, they will open and close the meetings. Uh, support collaborative decision and review and provide input on the uh, meeting agendas. Uh, and the way that is going to look like is for opening and calling roll call and moving the meeting along. Um, there will be a script um, with some information and general like, guidance on how to do that um, in the formal um, environment, similar to what the mayor has for opening city council meetings. Uh, they'll be provided by city staff. Um, and then you also receive copies of the agenda before the meetings um, and to be an opportunity to give input on those. The first uh, duty of this chair and vice chair will be to take the work plan and topic schedule to uh, city council. Um, there is a meeting that is tentatively scheduled a presentation on March 9th, so that evening. And we do plan to have some time allotted during the February 22nd meeting so that the next meeting uh, for the board to discuss with the chair and vice chair how you will be presenting that information. Um, 
So the way that this process, oh, uh, yes, Liz. Yeah, really quick. In the interest of what we talked about earlier, maybe this isn't the exact time to bring this up, but if we talk about the work plan and bringing next meeting and bringing that to the council to the night, I'm wondering if because we had a lot of uh, community members provide us initial you know, information about how we, you know, what kinds of things we might want to cover in this public safety advisory board, do we need to have some time to get that out to the community? I'm just wondering, based on what we talked about earlier, if we might not need a period to make the community aware that um, that the the public safe that we're that we've come up with something that we're going to be presenting. So just trying to be sensitive to to that. So I just I don't know if this is the time to bring it up or if it's more appropriate next week, but. Uh, you know, as somebody who's really interested in community engagement on everything, I'm always interested to make sure, you know, that we have adequate time for, um, for them to at least be aware of it and maybe ask questions or, or make suggestions. So anyway, just a thought. Thank you. No, that's a excellent thought. Um, we, so March 9th would be a month away. So how much time would you recommend um, giving the public to be able to write? So after this meeting, we will have a completed work plan and topic schedule, at least from this board. Um, so how much time would you like to give the public? Or would well, it, the, it yeah, if, the, if, if we talk about it on the 22nd, you know, packet material usually goes out a week or two ahead of the meetings to the council. So I'm just doing the math. So mm -hmm. it seems like we needed a couple of weeks for the community to be able to maybe look at it. And I'd be interested to hear, hear what everybody else on the, on the board thinks, but you know, a couple of weeks at least for people to take a look at it before it gets forwarded to council. I just wanna make sure we're getting in the habit of um, at least making the community aware that it's out there just to see. Um, you know, we, we've established this board to do a lot of the heavy lifting, but I know it's important to us that we make sure that we're connected with the community along the way. So a couple of weeks anyway, I, you know, that's what I would suggest. Maybe other people have thoughts. And that's an excellent suggestion. I'll, um, we'll be meeting up again on Wednesday with our work group. Um, so we'll get together with city staff and look at a maybe a further date um, than March 9th. Thank you. Um, any other questions about um, what the chair and vice chair's responsibilities are? Okay, so going into the way this process is going to work is I'm going to call for nominations for chair. Please feel free to nominate yourself. Um, if there is more than one nominee, um, we'll, I'll ask each of you to make some sort of statement about why you would like to be chair. Um, you'll have two minutes. Following that, we will have a roll call vote of the board um, for the chair position, and then we will do the same process for the vice chair. Any questions about that process? Excellent. Um, so any nominations for chair? And please uh, shout out. I'd like to nominate Jim um, Brown, if he accept. Jimmy Brown, will you accept that nomination? Uh, I see your hand, yeah. Um, sure, I think. <laughs> yes, I'll, I will accept the nomination, yes. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to nominate themselves or um, another for chair. Seeing and hearing none, uh, congratulations, Jimmy Brown. Welcome to the first chairmanship of the Public Safety Advisory Board. So same process. Um, would anyone like to nominate themselves or of another board member for vice chair? I'd like to nominate Abdi. 
Avdi, do you accept this nomination? Um, yeah, sure, uh, I would love to. Excellent. Would anyone else like to nominate themselves or someone else for vice chair? Seeing and hearing none, uh, congratulations, Abdi. Welcome to the first vice chairship. Oh, um, I do see a raised hand, Jimmy Brown. Oh, um, in, I think in our first meeting, we talked about this as, as being rotational. Mm -hmm. We were able to, you know, provide that kind of experience and, and connection to all the group or anyone that's interested in the group. Is that still the process that we're using? Yes, yes. So I'm um, sorry if I wasn't clear. This is the chairmanship and vice chairmanship for the early action, which is body cams, as well as the uh, sub topic, subunit around hiring. And then when we move on to the training subtopic, we will um, do this process again, um, and we will do it two weeks before we plan to move to the next subtopic. Uh, excellent. Uh, so Avdi and Jimmy, you can expect to start seeing materials coming out from um, city staff as well as myself. Um, like I said, you will have materials for um, being able to open and close the meetings, as well as uh, the agendas in advance and um, support for uh, your uh, city council presentation, which will be March 9th or later. Great, um, so I'm just gonna take a minute and talk about where we're going next. Um, everybody should have received this document, which is the upcoming meeting snapshot. Um, the first one is this meeting. Um, and then we've got the body cam presentation from Sergeant Erickson, followed by discussion. Um, with that, if the discussion is not resolved on February 22nd, it can be moved. This is very tentative as a schedule goes. Um, on March 8th, if we complete the body cam discussion, we'll be talking about um, hiring and uh, background investigations. I know there were a lot of questions that came up around body and uh, background investigations during um, the topic schedule conversation. Um, and that will be led by Commander McDonald and Brandy uh, Leas from uh, City of Tigard HR. And we'll be continuing um, that discussion, I expect, on March 22nd's meeting. Any questions about where we go, where we're going? And we'll be constant, continue, constantly updated so you'll always see what the next four meetings um, look like. Hey, Kim, real yes. quick, it's Jamie. I just wanted to ask uh, everybody on the board that if you have any questions that uh, you would like to see answered surrounding say body cams for the next session. If you could forward those to either myself or Eduardo, then we can make sure that we incorporate those into the presentation and get those answered, hopefully as we're doing the presentation. That way you, you all are getting the most up-to-date information. And then same with hiring and background investigations. I did see that there was quite a few points in the, in the comments tonight. So we'll incorporate that stuff into those. So if you have those, please go ahead and send them ahead of time. If you think about them, you just fire them off and then we'll, we'll try and make sure that those get incorporated as best possible into those presentations as we're developing them. The body more camera one is just about done, but it's certainly not too late to incorporate those if you have those. Yeah, I'm gonna say just for ease of communication channels, um, please send everything to Eduardo. Um, and he will make sure that everything gets to the commander. I think that'll be the easiest way. Um, and Lee, I see your hand. Hey guys. Hey, I just had a question. Um, I'm wondering when we are actually going to have the topic of racial equality. That is a big issue that is going on in Tigard uh, that I unfortunately am part of. Um, I think that's a serious discussion that needs to happen and uh, things need to get brought out uh, to the light because maybe a lot of people aren't seeing and understanding what's going on. Um, but just wondering when that possibly could happen. Um, I know we are addressing topics are, um, 
outcomes related to uh, racial inequality in, in several different areas. Um, but there might be uh, other opportunities. Um, Valerie, I see your hand. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I'm late. I had a client meeting run over. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to second that because one of the question things that we talked about when we were joining this board was the the book how to talk to people about race right i believe that you know there was a discussion about having some discussion about that in this context and mm -hmm. i was wondering where that's where that's planning on being slotted in yeah so i think the areas in the current topic schedule is that deal with more the outcomes and police procedures and where racial inequality may be showing up um i don't see looking at the list right now a topic specifically around racial equality i think i would challenge just to say let's think about where it's showing up and try to to work on it that way and include all it maybe is sub discussions around racial equality i, I don't that. think that, i don't think that that i mean i think that it's it's an overriding issue and so i understand the need to be practical and how we approach this and sort of systems oriented but but i do agree with what lee's saying that i think that it's a an issue that touches so many different areas that it probably does deserve to have some independent discussion and maybe we work that independent discussion throughout the you know our work on this board um mm -hmm. setting aside maybe 15 or 20 minutes of each of the discussions to address matters in that area um but but i but i think that that informs a lot of the discussions that we at least i at least had thought that we would be having as we as we move forward with this yes no no doubt it definitely will come up in i mean we've, we've already seen questions around that and i know the the commander is planning to to address it when it comes right. to I mean, um, hiring right no kim but i but i i understand that you think that it will fit in sort of no from no I, i'm just agreeing that it should be an overarching discussion right. i'm okay. agreeing with you yep um opti um i just wanted to say um like i agree with what both of you guys are saying but like, like for example with with the way that i'm going about this board constantly all the time i'm thinking about the racial justice and the equity portion of how this you know outcome will affect our communities of color um like it's not something that just like is one section that we talk about it should be constantly throughout it should be this constant discussion of understanding how does this affect this community how are people how is, especially our communities of color and our minority communities who are oftentimes you know not the most fond with our police you know how are we going to constantly like think about them and have them um, be in the front of our conversation? So it's, I think it's, it's just an always thing that we should have in our mind. We shouldn't have a specific section to it. It should just be always throughout it. Right. So what do you think of the idea then of, of dedicating some time, Abdi, to discussing it as we go along as an overarching theme? I think the chief wants to say something real quick. Go ahead, chief. Chief, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, when it was crafted and designed, again, it was with a vision of uh, our elected officials in response to uh, George Floyd and, and the eight can't wait and a lot of things. And so now we're getting into it. And so I, I think envision that we needed to um, educate or at least give a foundation like like many of the questions that you had as we were trying to just do the presentation you guys were already thinking and going in different directions and and we were trying to uh provide that information uh but if i i, I get that the the topics that are most important to you and i think that's part of how we have to be a little bit nimble yeah so um are there any other comments on valerie's suggestion that we dedicate 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes of each session towards talking about racial equality and specifically and how that affects the topics that we're discussing that week. Um, all right, I see Justin has seconded that. I see a lot of thumbs up. So I will um, work that into the work plan um, as a dedicated portion of every meeting that we'll be discussing um, racial equality and how that affects the topics. Excellent. Well, that is um, all we had for tonight. Um, it is 6.44. Um, we've completed the work plan and the topic schedule. Um, you'll see updated copies of them both this week. Um, congratulations to Jimmy and Avdi, our new chair and, oh, um, chair and vice chair. And, and I do have a question. 
Yeah, and I do Yay. see one hand um, from Danny before we wrap up. Yeah, just real quick um, on the topic of uh, a Valerie suggestion. I, I do like that suggestion um, and it would be a practical way to, you know, weave racial justice throughout everything that we do and talk about. I guess my hope would, I could easily see, you know, because we're all so passionate. It sounds like all of us, you know, are really on this board because racial justice is kind of at the forefront of what we're working toward. Um, and I could easily see kind of time being an issue where it's like, we, we might want to talk about this issue and go deeper, other questions will come up. And I think maybe from the, for, for you, Kim, and for the other people kind of organizing these meetings and, oh, and our coach, our chair and co-chair, like, I think we, my, my thought and suggestion is that we're just super specific and even narrow in terms of like a discussion topic that relates to the focus of the meeting and racial justice so that it could help focus us, you know, um, rather than, you know, it being a little bit more open-ended where, you know, time could be a limit. Like, I guess just from my personal experience, 10 minutes on racial justice, I, I, I never have conversations that short around the topic so, so deep and heavy and important. So I would just suggest that we're as practical and, and specific as possible in terms of what do we want to talk about related to this topic and racial justice. Uh, excellent point. Um, well taken. Um, Justin, I see your hand. Um, building off of that really um, practical suggestion that Danny had just brought up, um, I'm curious because we did a very thorough and in-depth process with our work plan and topic schedule in regards to um, Tigard Police Department and all of the different issues that we'd like to address with it if maybe um, in order to be able to let all of our community representatives air out their ideas and thoughts about racial justice, and then be able to dive into the units with that more um, guided and focused approach with the racial equity conversations, if we could maybe create a space to have a conversation about where all of us as representatives on this board are coming from with uh, racial equity and racial justice and be able to kind of um, aggregate and collect those thoughts. So that way everyone on here who, um, if I'm hearing correctly, kind of signed on for uh, a conversation about racial justice as well, has an opportunity to be able to share their thoughts, voice their concerns and maybe bounce ideas off of other folks. Um, yeah, um, let's, let's think about that, um, discuss that for, for a minute. Um, so you, you are imagining a, a session now following these ones before we go into the units around a racial justice conversation uh, that's more freewheeling. Am I hearing that correctly? Maybe it doesn't need to be freewheeling, but I, I get the sense, and especially from the comments that um, uh, Valerie Lee and Danny had brought up, that we haven't necessarily been able to dive into maybe just a larger discussion about this. And I know that we're also prepping our topic schedule and work plan, um, but I get a sense that maybe if we are able to, and it doesn't need to be an entire meeting, but are able to carve out some space for that conversation that then maybe when we go forward into the units, it'll be easier for us as uh, board members to then uh, dive into those topics and then also stay focused on when we have maybe those 15 to 10 minutes of racial justice that are specific to those units. Uh, Jimmy, I see your hand. Um, one, I, I really appreciate all the, the statements that have been made by, by the group, because I think in some respects, it's, it's almost as though this is the elephant in the room, and we're not sure how to eat the elephant. Do we start at the front? Do we start at the back? Do we eat one bite at a time? Or do we just try and choke it all down at once? Um, I think there's, there is a sense that before we talk about 
racial equity, uh, racial justice and equity, that we give space to talk about what that means to us. Um, because we have X number of people who have, who look at the, who look at this in perhaps some different uh, viewpoints. And, and I think it would be good to have a discussion um, about what, what we see that meaning as it relates to the work of the PSAB. Um, in, in one respect, we are in a informative place around the Tiger Police Department. So they are in, in effect uh, teaching us, instructing us about how the department works, its goals, its budget, its organizational structure. And so we are getting that bit of information. Um, and I think that's good. The other piece of that is we're all community members coming in to listen to what the department wants to tell us. And we have some things that we want to say, that we want to talk about, that our communities want to know information about. And so I think it, it, it's, it's a balancing act that, that, uh, that says, let's not get so caught up into the into the weeds of the department that we forget or not include the elements of what brings a lot of us here. Um, because my friends that I see in my community are focused on, well, Jimmy, is the PSAB going to talk about, you know, issues of concerns with, with how police officers deal with young men of color in Tigard? Um, and so I think we, I, I want to respect that. I, and I want to use this platform, this forum, to be able to, to, to bring those uh, bits and pieces of information into the discussion too. Again, that's not to denigrate or devalue um, the work that the department has put together to inform us of this is what the department is, this is how we do what we do, um, this is how we're structured, all very important stuff. Um, and I want to see the, the overlay of, you know, racial justice and equity as to how the department deals with those issues as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes um, a lot of sense. Thank you for, um, I see in the, the comments, um, Justin, thanking you as well, and Valerie for, for your comments. Um, I think, um, the, the foundation that we were looking for is that we get the police foundation, but um, I would say that if there are co concerns in the community that aren't in the topic schedule, we should definitely revisit those, um, as well as um, having a conversation around racial justice and equity and what brings everybody into this room. And so I will work with city staff and we will look at um, rescheduling future to make sure that we can have that conversation as well as Valerie's suggestion that we are talking about it um, during these meetings uh, because because what you say is is completely correct. Um, Abdi, I, or uh, actually Lee, I think his hand was up first. Yeah, I was just uh, agreeing with Mr. Brown. Um, it's kind of hard to say if a conversation needs to happen in, in like bullets, like, you know, like a 15 minute, 20 minute conversation. We had so much discussion earlier about the mental health issue that was going on in Tigard, but that's not the only issue. There's so much more. The racial equality doesn't necessarily just have to do with you look at a person of color and you think differently, but how we are treated in a whole the places where we live, the difference between, oh, my place is gonna get fixed or I can do certain things and get in trouble, but other people can do everything and not get in trouble at all. Um, there is a level of, of racial equality that's in that area as well. So it's just one of those things that we, we just need to elaborate on that. Um, just, I agree totally with Mr. Brown and what everybody pretty much is saying. Thank you. And Abdi? I just, um, I'm just 
you know, passing on just a, just a word of, uh, of, of caution, because too many times what you see is you see um, people say, oh, yeah, we care about equity and inclusion. We care about, you know, racial equality. And then what they do is they talk about the issue and then they say, OK, we're going to leave a portion of it. Then we're going to talk about race. And then what happens is they don't really talk about race during the issue. And then it's forgotten behind and that race conversation goes a different direction. So I just I'm just like being a word of caution to constantly not only just talk about it in that 15 minute portion that we talk about racial equity, but during those segments where people are talking about the issues, bring up the, you know, racial equality and like how these are going to be affecting these minority communities because we like separate, this should be constantly intertwined at all times. Excellent reminder. Thank you. Um, and Valerie. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, Abdi, your point is very well taken, um, and, and I do think it needs to be front of mind, but I think that's what Jimmy was getting to when he was talking about balancing, um, you know, the, the need for us to understand where the police are coming from, and the need for us to understand what their processes look like, and, you know, all of the mechanics that go into that, but then also be able to take a step back and have a discussion about a lot of these issues, and, you know, how you know, how disparate impact happens and in, in particularly in some of these areas that we're talking about that are built into the plan. But, um, you know, also providing space. And I, I think Jimmy's use of that phrase is, is really well taken to have a discussion about some systemic issues and some other issues that are important to communities. So, you know, so I think, I think Abby, your point is really well taken. And I think it's important that we integrate this as part of the overall discussion. Um, and it may mean that it just takes longer to get through the unit than sticking to, you know, a strict schedule that, that I'm sorry, Kim, we're messing up your schedule. Um, it's not my schedule. It's, it's your schedule. <laughs> but, but I do think that that is a way, I think, to integrate a lot of these concerns that some of us are feeling, but still, you know, be respectful of, of the staff's hard work and putting these units together for us to, you know, to become educated and understand the balance there. So that's all I had to say. Yeah, and I just want to thank in these last couple of minutes everybody for, for bringing this up and that this is something that is of a concern that we haven't done a good job of addressing, making sure we're talking about racial equality. Um, this is, to go back to the, that word co-creation, this is, this is your board. Um, if, if there is something that is missing, please speak up um, as tonight, um, make sure we're centering that conversation. Um, and thinking about other ways to, to have these conversations, making sure we're having the 15, 20 minutes of racial equity conversation if it's not already being integrated. Um, so thank you very, very much for bringing that up. Um, and with that, it is 6.57. Uh, we will be, oh, um, Councillor Newton, Liz. Sorry, I wanted to wait. Um, I agree with what's being said and for me, um, hearing uh, how everyone's um, impacted and to quote Jimmy Brown, what your community's concerned about. As we move forward on these topics, I think knowing ahead of time where you're all coming from on this issue would really help me as we're going through the different topics uh, to Abdu's point, making sure each time we cover it, we're looking at this, but it would help me to remember Jimmy Brown said this two, two weeks ago, and are we thinking about this? So, you know, I'm agreeing that I think it's important to have a conversation about where, every, where everybody sits on this and making sure that as we go through the units, we remember where everybody's coming from and we, that's the context of how we look at the units. So um, I, I just wanted to um, commend everybody for bringing this up and and I agree that it's important to both have the conversation and also remember as we're working through these units that that's really the lens that we're looking through, you know. And um, uh, I think the education as we go forward will be informative for everybody and be beneficial. And I think that's where the police department's interest is too, is making sure that their services reflect the, the importance, the values of our community. So it would be helpful. Thank you. And uh, Chief, would you like to close us out? I do. I, and, you know, this really is a testament to all of you really um, kind of getting started to find your voice. Again, we had a framework that we thought would be laid out that 
uh, because we knew all we heard in the police department is recommendations, recommendations from this group, which may be the end result. And so naturally intuitive, we said, well, we wanna show you what we do before you tell us how to fix it or if we needed to be broken. So we went down a path of saying, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna tell you everything like we would a community academy and then just tell us where we can insert it. Um, I think it's, I, 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 I hear the points and I think that is gonna be uh, where we really kind of get to see where this goes is no problem with the, the racial equity and, and we'll navigate and figure out how